point to shortcomings in public policy. In the post-Civil War era, the Slater, Peabody, and Jeans Fund supported schooling for blacks in the South, addressing a need to which officials, to say nothing of public sentiment, were indifferent or downright hostile. On the eve of World War II, the Carnegie Corporation gave birth to a scrupulously documented, deeply analytical study, Gun Murdoch's An American Dilemma, that focused a new spot spotlight on the massive failure of public policy in the field of racial justice. The point I am making is that philanthropy has often been most effective when it is dared to go beyond charity. In the 1965 report on private foundations, the US Treasury Department recognized the special nature of philanthropy by describing foundations as uniquely qualified to initiate action, experiment with new and untried ventures, dissent from prevailing attitudes, and act quickly and flexibly. Philanthropy is a wonderful asset when used creatively and wisely for maximum strategic impact. My second observation is that philanthropy should invest in the empowerment of those who are economically and socially marginalized. Philanthropy can help educate the public on the policies and practice needed to make our society work for all of us, all of its citizens. But it is not enough to be simply advocates who speak and act in behalf of the marginalized groups in our communities. We must help empower them to speak and act for themselves. If racism was the original American sin, the persistence of paternalism may be its most enduring counterpart. One of the most striking and fundamental lessons coming from around the world is that when we empower the historically excluded to be active participants in the programs designed for their advancement, we are likely to have not only new ideas and wider ownership of strategies, but we are likely to have increased effectiveness as well. We have all too often asked the wrong question in dealing with those who suffer from prejudice and poverty. We've been asking, what can we do about that predicament? Or what can we do for them when we should have been asking, what can we do together? Self-help is a principle all groups admire and often desire. But too many people assume that it means that those disadvantaged by condition or color should be able to lift themselves by their own bootstraps even when they have no boots. I like the concept of assisted self-reliance or participatory empowerment, where the effective groups provide leadership, but they are supported by outside resources. My third observation, philanthropy should invest in boundary crossing leadership. People who can unite other people. People who appeal to our hopes rather than our fears. Strategic investments in a new generation of leaders can help bring new talent into mainstream institutions, equip our sector and the larger society to deal with the new demographic reality, and cultivate civic and social entrepreneurs who are the agents of progress in the struggle to form a more perfect union. Although the present leadership climate may appear at first glance to be a leadership vacuum, it is more likely that we have been simply looking in the wrong places for leadership. 
if we have learned anything from those who are building new societies in Eastern Europe and Southern Africa and elsewhere, it is that the next generation of leaders is not likely to fit the traditional mold, nor are those leaders likely to be found in traditional places. The days of looking for leaders with the right endorsement by traditional elites as defined by those elites may be coming to an end. The leaders of the future are not likely to come riding out of the sunset on white charges, heroes without heroism. Many will instead be ordinary people with extraordinary commitments. Their styles will be different, their accents will be different, and so will their color and complexion. When I completed my tour as the United States Ambassador to South Africa, I traveled around the country and around the United States, meeting with policymakers, opinion leaders, and just ordinary people to solicit their thinking about what concerned them most when they looked to the future. Some spoke of the need for political leaders who seek power to disperse it rather than simply dominate it. Others spoke of the need for civil servants who understand that bureaucracies can be both efficient and humane. Some talked about the need for business leaders who understand that ethics is good business, that running a morally sensitive corporation can contribute directly to the bottom line. Others talked about the need for civic leaders who understand both the potential and the limits of civil society. What I kept hearing was the need for a new approach to leadership development one focused as much on what it means to be responsible as a leader as what it means to be efficient as a leader. So I decided to commit my own future to identifying and helping to train a generation of leaders who understand the difference between proclaiming moral absolutes and clarifying moral ambiguities a generation committed to using ethics to heal rather than hurt, to bring people together rather than divide them. I have been living and working in South Africa either full or part-time for more than a decade. And one of the most important things I have learned is that reconciliation requires leaders who are themselves prototypes of the kind of society they seek to build. While we in the United States have been obsessed with the microethics of individual behavior, the private virtues that build character, the South Africans have been concerned with the macroethics of our aggregate existence, the public values that build community. In the leadership program that I developed, we seek to bring both forms of ethics into the balance that is needed for a world that is integrating and fragmenting at the very same time. My fourth observation, we need to invest to unleash and inform the philanthropic impulse that lies in all of our citizens and in all of our communities. While there is a tendency to think of historically disadvantaged groups only in relation to the demand side of philanthropy, many are now in a position to contribute to the supply side. When I did research for my book, The Charitable Impulse, I found that where there is a sense of belonging, there is likely to be a sense of mutual obligation and responsibility. But the new groups must be made to feel that they belong before they are willing to transform their own traditions of sharing and helping into organized giving in their communities. 
Few Americans realize how deep and how enduring are the giving traditions of some of the groups that are changing the face of our civic culture. As early as 1598, Latinas in the Southwest formed mutual aid groups to assist members with their basic needs by serving as vehicles for self-help, social cohesion, and a positive group identity. Long before the Tocqueville became the most quoted and probably the least read <laughs> expert on American civic life, Benjamin Franklin had become so enamored of the political and civic culture of the Native Americans he met in Philadelphia that he advised delegates to the 1754 Albany Congress to emulate the civic habits of the Iroquois. Long before Martin Luther King wrote his letter from a Birmingham jail, African Americans had formed so many voluntary groups and mutual aid societies in the 19th century that several states enacted laws banning black voluntary or charitable organizations. Long before Robert Bella wrote Habits of the Heart, Neo-Confucians in the Chinese community were teaching their children that a community without benevolence invites its own destruction. Long before the first organized of charity by the European settlers, Native Americans engaged in giveaways, which reached its most advanced form in the potlash ceremonies of the tribes of the Northwest, as well as in the custom of Chippewa mothers who used to tell their young daughters to take a dish of food to a neighbor simply to teach the child to give and share. In the African-American community in which I grew up in Southwest Louisiana, the rivers of compassion ran deep. When we were hungry, we shared with each other. When we were sick, we cared for each other. But we did not think of what we gave to others as philanthropy, because sharing was an act of reciprocity in which both the giver and the receiver benefited. We did not think of what we did for others as voluntary, because caring was as much a moral imperative as an act of free will. The point I'm making is twofold. One, the early manifestations of civic feeling among the racial minorities who are destined to play a larger role in the civic life of the nation were remarkable, not simply in how they served the poor and the dispossessed in their midst, but remarkable also in the consistency of the civic values they affirmed with the ideals and aspirations of the larger society. And secondly, while the giving and helping traditions of these groups are deep and enduring, many of the new groups have a limited knowledge of the techniques of organized giving in perpetuity. All of our people will benefit then from targeted efforts both to activate the latent charitable impulse and to provide information on the many incentives, options, and techniques that can be used for organized giving. My fifth observation, our concern with equity must begin with our own institutions, how they operate, and what we do to try to level the playing field. We need to step back and ask what assumptions, what social analysis lies behind our great grant making? What theory of change informs our investments and priorities? How often is equity in a consideration in what we consider as successful? And finally, do we have an organized and disciplined way of learning what truly 